Hello there. My name is Gijsbert Stoet and I work as a psychologist at the university where I do research and where I teach psychology. My name is Dutch and if you find Gijsbert too difficult you can just call me Gilbert. In this short lesson I'm going to talk about experimental cognitive psychology. Now first I'm going to say a few things about experimental cognitive psychology. Let me tell you a few things about what we mean with experimental cognitive psychology. It is uh, it's a long phrase. Cognitive psychology is the psychological study of cognition. I might think that doesn't bring me much further. Now You know what psychology is. Psychology is the study of uh, behavior and thought. So what is cognition then? Cognition is a word borrowed from the classical language Latin and it means to know. Cognitive psychology is about how our knowledge is organized and how it is created by what we see, hear, smell, feel and how it sends commands to our muscles so that we can operate in a goal-directed way. Typically, cognitive psychologists study topics such as memory, perception, sensation, action and language. For example, a cognitive psychologist might study how the things we see are being remembered, how are they stored in memory. It might be the case that some things are not so well remembered and other things are remembered very well. How come? That's the question. So it is the role of the cognitive psychologist to study the conditions under which memory works well and the conditions under which it doesn't work very well. But there are numerous other topics cognitive psychologists study ranging from how we catch a ball when it comes, an imaginary ball in this case, and how children learn language. For example, catching a ball seems a trivial activity, but it, yeah, it is actually a very complex process. You need to track the path of the ball, you need to predict when it's near enough to catch it, and uh, you will also need to take into consideration how long it will take to bring up your arms uh, so that you can grasp it. And that's exactly why today we don't have robots that can play basketball or volleyball, even though we have very smart computers. Now, what do we study in the cognitive laboratory? I would like to tell you a few things about uh, the cognitive laboratory, uh, the things that you can find in there. A cognitive laboratory can be relatively simple, and typically it is very simple. It is just a small room with a table, a few chairs and some equipment. But even in the simplest cognitive laboratory, you will typically find a computer. Computers can play an essential role in cognitive experiments because they can display information or play sounds and they can record behavioral responses with great accuracy. The images or texts that are shown on a computer screen um, are called stimuli Stimuli is the plural of stimulus. A stimulus is simply a stimulus of the sense organs. And uh, images on the screen, they are called visual stimuli. Sounds are called auditory stimuli. And uh, of course, you need to know that in the laboratory we do not just stimulate the sense organs, but we also measure how people respond to stimuli. A response is a physical response to a stimulus or to multiple stimuli. A good example of a response is a button press. There are different ways to measure responses. You can imagine that it is relatively easy to measure something like a button press. You can just let the computer record the, the, the button that's being pressed and you can record the time it took to uh, press the button. We can then measure how much time there is between the presentation of something on the screen and the button press. Computers are really good in measuring when exactly a button is being pressed. Um, and sometimes psychologists, they use very sophisticated uh, keyboards, uh, not just the standard keyboard that you have, such as this one here. It has nice colorful buttons and it uh, can measure response times uh, at a millisecond uh, resolution. Now an important thing of the cognitive laboratory is that it is quiet. You want to make sure that your phone is switched off 
and you want to make sure that there is no distraction in the neighboring rooms. So if there is something going on, like a renovation where they use hammers and drills, you can just forget about your cognitive experiment. The people that come to the laboratory are usually called participants or subjects. The person who carries out the study is called the experimenter. A typical experiment in the cognitive laboratory takes about half an hour to one hour. Half an hour to one hour is an ideal time because we know that people won't get too tired in that time. And we also know that we can collect enough data for a meaningful data analysis. But sometimes uh, that time frame is not long enough. You need a little bit more time. Sometimes we want to study how people learn things over longer periods. And in those cases, we ask participants to come to the laboratory multiple times. Typically, we study multiple participants, not just one. There are situations where studying one participant might be meaningful, but typically we want something between 15 and 30 participants. So you have 15 to 30 people that all come for half an hour to one hour. For some studies, you need far more subjects. And for some studies, you can do with just a handful. Ultimately, how many participants you need depends on uh, what sort of experiment you're exactly doing. For example, if you want to study the difference between how men and women carry out a certain computer task, you will likely need at least 30 men and 30 women. To determine how many participants you will need exactly is a science on itself. This is often called a power analysis, referring to the statistical power of a study. Now I would like to say something about a specific experiment. I'm going to talk about visual search. Searching is something we do quite often, uh, and there is this a direct link between our daily life experience and uh, what we study in the cognitive laboratory. For example, today you might already have searched for a piece of fruit, for your wallet, for a coin, or for your phone. Understanding searching is not only interesting for purely academic reasons, it's also something that can improve the quality of our lives. For example, psychologists might help to improve the way the mountain rescue services find a lost hiker in the hills. Imagine you're sitting in a helicopter and you're flying and you're looking out for that lost hiker. You're then essentially doing a uh, search task, a visual search task. It might be quite a difficult task, because there's so many things in the landscape that might look like a lost hiker, but that are not a lost hiker. Uh, a question for researchers might be what the features are that we need to look for when we are looking for a lost hiker. And which sort of like features help uh, the hiker to be distinguishable from the background. It's this sort of problem where cognitive psychological research can have a real impact on improving the lives of people and where it can help, for example, improving the mountain rescue services. Cognitive psychologists have carried out hundreds of studies on how we search. Now, let me give you a real life example of visual search. For example, searching for a coin is something that you do quite often. Often you search for a coin in your pocket, but sometimes you search for a coin on the table. Now, in the UK, we have the pound coin. Okay. One pound coin is a gold coin, it's quite thick, and it's of medium size. So, if you search for a pound coin and there's nothing else, it's very easy to find. You just see it laying there. But if you try to find a pound coin in this heap here, it's hard to find. There it is, in the middle. So what we can do as cognitive psychologists is to measure the time that it takes somebody to find a pound coin. The time to find something is called the search time. Now, in this example, of course, to find the coin takes very little time. But if we go back to our example of the mountain rescue service, you can think about the search time of finding a lost hiker. It might take a couple of hours. In the cognitive laboratory, 
uh, visual search tasks uh, take a short time, and the visual search time is typically something between a fraction of a second to a couple of seconds. Now, one of the important questions for cognitive psychologists is to find out what exactly determines the search time. Now, if you have looked at these coins here, you might say, oh, I know what it is. It's just the number of coins that you're not looking for that uh, increase the search time. Now, that makes a lot of sense, but that is not the exact truth. It is more complicated than that. More factors play a role, and I'm going to show you that here. Here, there are many coins. Interestingly, the pound coin just pops out. You just see it immediately. So what that means is that it is not simply the number of coins that determines the search time. There are other factors that play a role. So what are these factors? So that is something that the cognitive psychologist tries to find out. Now there have been hundreds of experiments that have looked into this. And what we know is that it is often the combination of features that people are searching for that determines the search time. So when you look at this heap on the left, in order to find the pound coin, you need to look at every coin and to you have to check whether it matches the various features of the pound coin. So what you're basically looking for is a relatively thick coin, medium size, and gold color. Now, so what you basically do is you go through all these coins and you see which coin matches these three features that you're looking for. In cognitive psychology, this sort of like search for multiple features is known as conjunctive search. Conjunctive is just another word for combination. So you look for the combination of a number of features. So the effect here is uh, of the one pound coin standing out is called the pop-out phenomenon. There are many other examples of this phenomenon. Uh, for example, it will be relatively easy to find a lost hiker when he or she is wearing a bright, jet, bright red jacket walking on a green field. That said, it will be difficult to find the hiker if he or she is wearing a green jacket. So that means it's not simply the number of things in the visual field that make a search hard. There are other factors that play a role as well. It is particularly difficult to find an object if we are looking for multiple features and if there is a large variety of, variety of features in the objects we are not searching for. In order to spot a pound coin amongst other coins, you need to check for each coin for multiple features, namely its size, thickness and color. And I've just shown you that here. Now, the coin example is just to show you that searching in daily life depends on various factors.